ancient Persia. Fearless, formidable, unrelenting. For ages, shrouded in mystery. An empire unparalleled in conquest and riches. To create an empire of the size of the Persian Empire, the largest empire the world had known, obviously takes military skills. From North Africa to Asia, it was a civilization driven by a dynasty of extraordinary rulers, ambitious and all-powerful. Cyrus the Great is one of the few who deserves to be called the Great. The Persian Empire created some of the most astonishing feats of engineering the world has ever seen. Magnificent palaces that rose up from barren desert roadways, bridges, and canals. Everyone has heard of the Suez Canal, but how many have heard of Darius's Canal? But dark clouds were on the horizon. An ancient rivalry with Greece would erupt into an epic clash that changed the course of history and shaped the Western world for thousands of years to come. In 330 BC, a young Macedonian king conquers the Persian Empire and leads his invading army into Persepolis, its spectacular capital city. The Macedonian ruler is Alexander the Great, an admirer of the great Persian kings. By sundown, the Greek victory celebration degenerates into a drunken melee. By sunup, Persepolis, the crown jewel of the Persian Empire, with palaces unrivaled anywhere in the world, is burned to the ground. More than 2,500 years later, these immense towers stand as testament to the soaring heights this now forgotten empire once reached. I equate Persia with luxury, with rich tapestries and beautiful rugs and my mother's fat, fuzzy Persian cat named Otis. But I also think of a fantastic Persian king named Cyrus the Great, who believed in religious and cultural tolerance, and who freed the Jews from Babylon to return to Israel. Hello, I'm Peter Weller, and welcome to the Persian Empire. Around 4000 BC, two nomadic tribes were starting to take root in a rich but hot Iranian plateau, the Medes in the north, the Persians in the south. Being is that these tribes were nomadic, they were more interested in survival than conquest. As they became less nomadic, they had to learn how to farm, in particular how to cultivate this fertile Iranian plateau. But to do that, they needed a source of water. The early Persians may have very well become dust in the winds of history had they not unlocked a source of water and just as importantly, a means to channel that water to their crops and settlements. And what makes this engineering feat so remarkable is that they found this water not from rivers or lakes or oceans, but from the most unlikely source of all, rocks. Persia emerged out of nothing, a rugged, hostile terrain built with only invention and determination. 3,000 years ago, nomadic early Persians roamed the parched, forbidding Iranian plateau. Finding water meant traveling long distances. It fell to a hybrid engineer, geologist and diviner called Amogani to figure out how to bring it back to his people. Using nothing more than stone chisels, Moganis would build the first cornerstone of the Persian Empire a breakthrough system of underground irrigation canals called canats. They began by harnessing gravity to exploit the natural topography of their land, which sloped relentlessly down from the Al Ghors Mountains towards the Persian Gulf. Vertical shafts were first dug down from the surface, and the tunnel was excavated horizontally for a short distance. Then another vertical shaft was built, approximately three-quarters of a mile up the slope, and the channel continued. It can be sometimes 20, 30, 40 kilometers away, so it's a very skilled operation, to the point where the gradient of the, of the water channel uh, meets the aquifer or the, uh, the, the groundwater sloping up at, at the point where the mountains begin. The angle of the slope was crucial. 
one unit in elevation for every hundred on the horizontal. Not too steep because that would erode the base of the, of the water channel and of course not so flat uh, as to prevent the water from moving to its intended destination. 2,000 years before Rome's legendary aqueducts, the Persians were channeling massive amounts of water over long distances. In hot, dry climates, with minimal loss due to leakage or evaporation. Water means food, but the engineering technology to locate that water and move it was a carrot that the Persians were dangling in front of their neighbors. Around 700 BC, all of these tribes were united under one legendary figure named Achaemenes, who founded a dynasty. But this dynasty thrived and flourished under one guy, a guy I would have liked to have met, named Cyrus the Great. Cyrus created and maintained an empire, thanks no doubt to his military savvy, but he was also a political genius. He was an excellent, benevolent manager of men. Historians have called him humanist. The Jews call him Mashiach or anointed one. His own people called him father, and even the Ionian Greeks whom he conquered called him a just and worthy lawgiver and ruler. Cyrus the Great came to power in 559 BC. It was the beginning of the Achaemenid dynasty. Their reign would change the course of history and redefine architectural possibility. If you're looking at the greatest personages in history who have affected the world. Cyrus the Great is one of the few who deserves that epithet, the one who deserves to be called the Great. The empire over which Cyrus ruled was the largest the ancient world had ever seen and may be to this day the largest empire ever. By 554 BC, Cyrus had crushed all rivals and became the undisputed leader of Persia. Now it was time to conquer the world. And if he was going to build an empire, he would need a magnificent capital city to reflect its growing stature. In 550 BC, Cyrus launched one of the most ambitious engineering projects anywhere in the ancient world, the Persian Empire's first great capital city at Pasargad, located in modern Iran. Cyrus was a very innovative builder, and I might add that his standards were particularly high. We can also say that his building project reflected in some ways the technologies that he found in the course of his various conquests. Like the Romans centuries later, the Persians were borrowers. They took the best and most advanced ideas from the cultures they conquered, then developed them even further into technologies uniquely their own. The art and engineering of Pasargad drew on influences as far-flung as Assyria, Egypt, and Asia Minor, thousands of miles away. There were stone workers, wood workers, brick makers, uh, relief makers, and we know that these were people often imported from all over the empire. Today, over 2,500 years later, crumbling ruins are the only remnants of what was once here, Persia's first shining capital city. Parsagad's showpiece was its two magnificent palaces surrounded by a majestic park and vast formal gardens. Among them, the first known appearance of the astonishing Paradisia, the four-quartered walled Persian gardens. The gardens had over 1,000 yards of channels of carved limestone, designed such that water would enter small basins every 16 yards. The Paradisia of Parsagad laid the foundations for many of the world's most magnificent gardens for the next two millennia. What's particularly different with the Paridesa is the application of the geometric design. So we have squares, rectangular designs, floral designs, cypress trees, wild grasses, roses, lilies, all kinds of vegetations. And this is the concept of the modern park as we know it. As Pasargad was being built, Cyrus added to his dominion one enemy kingdom after another. 
But Cyrus was a very different kind of king. He refused to enslave his new subjects, a revolutionary concept in the ancient world. He recognized the local validity, if you will, of different religions and beliefs and uh, allowed those things to, to persist. In 539, Cyrus conquered Babylon, but he did not present himself as a conqueror. He presented himself as a liberator, rescuing these people from their despotic ruler. And then he did a totally unprecedented thing. He freed the Jews. The Jews had been living in Babylon in captivity ever since Nebuchadnezzar destroyed Jerusalem and their temple, and Cyrus freed them. Now, it could be said in hindsight or political history that Cyrus was looking for a buffer state between a hostile Egypt and his own empire. But so what? The point is, is that no one had ever done anything like this, and hardly anyone has ever done anything like it since. But subsequently, he is the only Gentile in the Bible to be referred to as Mashiach, or Messiah. As uh, one distinguished Oxford scholar once said to me, Cyrus always had a very good press. <laughs> it's, a, it's a very true uh, statement. Before he could launch the campaign that would make Persia the lone superpower of the ancient world, Cyrus the Great died in battle in 530 BC. He didn't live long enough to show what really he could have done outside the battlefield. So in that sense, you can compare him with Julius Caesar, who conquered, but did not live long enough, uh, he was assassinated, to put the empire that he conquered together. By the time Cyrus died, the Persian Empire had three capitals, Babylon, Susa, and Ekbatana. But he chose to be buried in the city he created, Pasargad in the tomb that mirrored the man who built it. At Cyrus's tomb, one of the aspects that shows his humility is that tomb is relatively unadorned, very simple, very elegant. Cyrus's engineers built the tomb in the form of simple but heavy stone Western structures. They began by laying large rectangular cut stones and used ramps, pulleys, and clamps to build the tomb to its height of 36 feet. The Tomb of Cyrus is a very simple, outwardly modest monument for somebody who uh, had created the largest empire that the world had seen to that date. And it's still remarkably well-preserved after 25 centuries. For 30 years, no power on Earth could stand up to Cyrus the Great. Now his throne was up for grabs, creating a power vacuum that would throw the ancient world into chaos. The word paradisia in Old Persian became paradise in ancient Greek. <laughs> 530 BC, Cyrus the Great, the architect of the greatest empire the world had ever known, is dead. For Persia, its future now hung in the balance. Rivals and pretenders to the throne vied for power. Then a distant cousin of Cyrus, a brilliant general, rose up to assume power. When the smoke cleared, the Persian Empire was securely in his grasp. His name was Darius. And he would become arguably the greatest Persian king and one of the greatest builders of all time. Darius hit the ground running. He began by rebuilding the old capital of Susa, with grand new palaces adorned in glazed brick. Today, the magnificence of the capital Susa is even found in the Bible. When the Greeks talk about Persian palaces, for example, they routinely mention Susa. When the Old Testament book of Esther uh, talks about Persian palaces, it's Susa that they mention. But the new king of Persia wanted a ceremonial capital all his own. 518 BC, Darius launched one of the most ambitious construction projects of the ancient world. Located near the modern city of Shiraz, 
it would become known as Persepolis, or Persian city in Greek. All of the palaces rose from a vast stone platform designed to enhance the stature of the empire. The Terrace Square is huge, over 125,000 square meters. And he had to modify the landscape. His engineers had to come in and level out part of the area, and they had to build a retaining wall. He wanted it to be seen from a distance. That's exactly why you build up a terrace, so it could be viewed from afar. That makes it all the more grand and imposing. Persepolis was a colossal engineering challenge, with walls more than 60 feet high and 35 feet thick, and great halls featuring intricately designed columns. Thousands of architects, craftsmen, and laborers, along with tons of materials, were brought from the far reaches of the empire. Most ancient empires were built by massive armies of slave labor. But Darius, like Cyrus, believed in paying for the work that built Persia's palaces and monuments. Every worker was given his due, his or her due, because we also find women in the workforce as well. Depending on their skill, what the quality they brought to the work, they were paid accordingly. No expense was spared. Persepolis would be the signature monument of Persian power and glory. First of all, it's important to remember the origin of the Persians themselves. That is to say that these were a nomadic people. They lived in tented accommodation, and they would up their tents, move somewhere else, and plant their tents again. Now, as time went on, these tents became more and more elaborate affairs. And essentially, what we're having at Persepolis is a tent turned into stone. The Apadana is nothing more than a stone tented building. The magnificent audience hall Darius built was called the Apadana. Each of those great monumental stone pillars are inspired by the kinds of wooden pillars that upheld a beautiful um, canvas roof. But now that canvas roof has turned to beautiful cedar wood instead. So the nomadic origins of the Persians gives um, the impetus to part of their architecture, but that's not all. The city's palaces were adorned in gold and silver, expensive tapestries and colorful tiles. The walls were studded with carved reliefs of peaceful depictions of visiting dignitaries from conquered lands. But Persepolis' spectacular engineering achievements extended far beyond the city walls. Its intricately designed and constructed water and drainage system were unrivaled anywhere. Before the actual soil was placed in, first, Darius's engineers constructed a drainage system, plumbing, drain pipes. These would be covered. Water was also brought in along the Kanat system. But then those drain pipes, which would drain the effluents out, those were taken underground below the surface where the visitor would never see that. Even during his most ambitious projects to enhance the empire's monuments and infrastructure, Darius never stopped expanding his empire. Under the brilliant leadership of Darius, the Persian Empire grew to staggering size. It included modern Iran and Pakistan, parts of Afghanistan, Armenia, Turkey, Syria, Egypt, Lebanon, Jordan, Palestine, parts of Central Asia, all the way to northern India. And man, this is a lot of turf. To connect the farthest reaches of the empire, Darius would launch two audacious building projects. One would stretch over 1,500 miles of the Persian Empire. The other would connect the Red Sea to the Mediterranean. Creating gardens was held in such high esteem that the Persian kings wished to be remembered as gardeners. Under the rule of Darius the Great, the Persian Empire grew to staggering proportions. Now he wanted to consolidate and connect the far-flung parts of his great kingdom. 515 BC, Darius orders his engineers to build a massive stone highway, one that would weave the empire together from North Africa to India. 
extending over 1,500 miles of the empire. He would call it the Royal Road. This was quite the engineering feat, because this had to traverse through mountains, forests, deserts. So typically, earth would be packed, hardened, for example. They may not have had, had uh, asphalt, but they certainly had knowledge of uh, packing gravel or tiny rocks. Laying down a stone road is vital in a terrain where there could be a high water table. You don't want to get your feet stuck in the mud. You don't want to get your cart stuck in the mud. So you have to raise the road surface up. That means laying down some kind of surface initially that will either absorb the groundwater or not allow the groundwater to uh, displace the road. The Royal Road was linked by 111 rest stations and inns every 18 miles, where travelers could eat, sleep, and switch to fresh horses. To ensure safety, watchmen were posted all along its great length. Now, I'm going to talk with my friend, Dr. Lloyd Llewellyn-Jones from the University of Edinburgh, professor of ancient history. i got to ask you this. Was it that safe? Essentially, yeah. I think what uh, uh, Darius, or Darius, if you will, manages to do here is an incredible feat. I mean, we're standing here in Turkey, OK? Right. And we could take one route straight the way through into central Iran. I mean, that's pretty good going. How fast? OK, so if we're on horseback and uh, we're riding from one of these little garrisons to garrison every 15 miles, changing fresh horses, we can do that in about six, seven days, maybe. Six, six or days. seven days. Yeah, yeah. So uh, you could send messages on this road, mm -hmm. friends yeah, next, most next city? most definitely. And, you know, and for trade, it, it's a godsend, as you can imagine. And this, this road cut through so much stuff. I mean, it just doesn't follow, you know, a, a formal pathway. It has to cross rivers, so it crosses the Tigris, it crosses by the ferry, River Hanus, right? by, by ferry, right. Uh, sometimes it clings to the side of mountains, sometimes it clings to the side of rivers. So the terrain is changeable. It's not drained or anything like that, so it's, it's not as advanced as some of the Roman roads we get right. later periods. So it doesn't have a gutter system. No, nothing like that, nothing like that. But what it's essentially is, it's sort of maybe 20 feet wide uh, with a sort of chipping base, which is good for horse treads and sure. that kind of stuff, you know. And which carriages really, and Exactly, and to carriage. get things through as quickly as you can, basically. Well, Lloyd, it's been a pleasure talking with you. Yeah, thank you for enlightening us about this incredible road. But Darius still wasn't through. There was one territory Darius had yet to firmly control the vast riches of North Africa, and he was determined to build a gateway there. He had his engineers devise a giant canal linking the Mediterranean and the Red Sea. Everyone has heard of the Suez Canal, but how many have heard of Darius's canal? What Darius did was build an east-west canal that was 130 miles long. With the Persian knowledge of hydrology, Darius's engineers used digging tools made of bronze and iron to first open the canal, then clear any blown sand and line it with stone ready for his ships to sail. It would take seven years to complete the 130-mile-long waterway with a massive labor force of Egyptian stone cutters and canal builders. Parts of the canal between the Nile and the Red Sea were, were actually not waterways, but just points along which the, the ships could be dragged uh, until they reached uh, another deeper portion where they could again sail their course. Darius says, I, Darius, king of kings, conqueror of Egypt, built this canal. He connected the Red Sea to the Nile River for trade, and he says, and ships were brought along my canal. By 513 BC, Persia was the largest empire the world had ever seen, even exceeding the size and wealth of Rome at its height four centuries later. Persia was invincible, and its appetite for conquest was beginning to frighten an emerging power across the Mediterranean, the city-states of Greece. Just a little geographical info. That big body of water out there is the Black Sea. This thin body of water here is the Bosphorus Strait that connects the Black Sea to the Mediterranean. So I'm standing in Asia, or Asia Minor, if you will, and that land over there is Europe. Now, Darius put down a revolt from some cities on the coast of Turkey, but this revolt had been supported by Athens, so Darius wanted to teach Athens a lesson. He was gonna march on Greece and attack that city, but how was he gonna do it? He's gotta go across the sea. 
Well, he takes a bridge of boats, pontoons, if you will, and lines them up from that point to that point and marches an army, so Herodotus says, of 70,000 men across the sea to attack Greece. Amazing. Persian engineers connected one side of the Bosporus to the other by scuttling boats side by side to form the foundation. Then they built a highway across the top, linking Asia to Europe. Probably this was a system of planks, and underneath there was a system of packed earth, or perhaps dry wood, to keep basically the road stable. Now, to keep the ships from wobbling, they must have used an anchor system of a certain weight, because if the anchor would have been too heavy, that would have, of course, tilted or damaged the ships. There was no breaking of the planks, not only due to the weight of the army crossing it, but due to the choppy waters of the Bosphorus. That's quite the feat of engineering before the age of computers. It is late August in the year 490 BC. Darius has already marched into Greece and taken Macedonia. Now he's destined to meet the Greek general Themistocles and an army from Athens and Corinth at the famous Battle of Marathon. A massive army from Persia numbers 60,000 or 140,000, 250,000, depending upon the propaganda you read. Suffice it to say, the Greeks are outnumbered 10 to 1. Their only recourse is to send for reinforcements. So the legendary runner Philippides runs from Marathon to Sparta, a distance of 140 miles in two days, hence the name of the race, Marathon. The two armies faced each other separated by a vast open plain. If they clashed head on, the massive Persian forces would mow down the greatly outnumbered Greeks. This was the beginning of the Persian Wars. A reduced Greek force attacked the Persians head on. The Persians went for an easy kill. But the remaining Greek forces had split into two and opened two other fronts against the Persians. Sucked into a bloody slaughter pit, the Persians suffered heavy losses and retreated. For the Greeks, it was a great victory. For the Persians, just a speed bump on their path to world domination. Darius decided to return home and turn his attention to shoring up Persepolis, his capital city. He would never get there. In 486 BC, Darius died on his way to quelling a rebellion in Egypt, leaving behind an empire that redefined the very notions of power and glory. He also prevented a replay of the chaos that followed the death of Cyrus by naming his successor, his son Xerxes. Now Cyrus the innovator and Darius the expansionist were very hard acts to follow but Xerxes had been a king in waiting all of his life. And a couple of his first acts were to suppress a rebellion in Babylon, another one in Egypt. And then he went after the Greeks. Somehow the Greeks just stuck in his craw. Some historians argue that Xerxes was making a preemptive strike. Others say that he was just cleaning up the business of his father. Whatever the case, the Greeks were no longer intimidated or impressed by the Persians since they'd beaten them at Marathon. And so Xerxes buddied up with the Carthaginian navy and the tip of what is now modern Tunisia, and he decided to beat the Greeks at sea. Discovered in 1931, Persepolis is one of the last archaeological excavations that dates back to the ancient world. For 80 BC, the Persian Empire is at its peak, vast, immensely powerful, and incredibly rich. It's been 10 years since the Greeks defeated Darius the Great at the Battle of Marathon. His son Xerxes is now the latest absolute monarch in Persia's Achaemenid dynasty, and Xerxes wants revenge. Greece is only beginning to emerge as a force to be reckoned with, a coalition of profoundly different city-states, from democracies to dictatorships. They are united only by one creed, their hatred of Persia. The ancient world is on the verge of the Second Persian War. The outcome will lay the foundation for the modern world. 
Greeks uh, traditionally called everybody except themselves barbarians. So this whole thing really uh, between East and West started probably with the Persians and the Greeks and continued ever since. The Persian invasion of Greece would be one of the greatest collaborations of strategy and engineering in military history. The massive invasion would be a complex land-sea assault demanding some astonishing feats of engineering. Xerxes wanted his forces to enter Greece at the Isthmus of Mount Athos, but the seas there were so turbulent, the king directed his builders to dig a canal across the Isthmus. With vast manpower and expertise in canal engineering, Xerxes' engineers took a mere six months to complete the canal across the Isthmus. But the next challenge facing his generals and architects was even greater. The huge Persian army still had to cross the one and a half mile wide Hellespont. To this day, their solution is considered one of the most ambitious engineering projects ever conceived for a military campaign. Borrowing a page from his father's book, Xerxes ordered a double pontoon bridge built across the Hellespont. A feat of engineering that would far surpass the bridge Darius built at the Bosporus. But what's very interesting is that 674 ships were now lined up. How were these ships kept stable? This must have been quite an engineering feat. The Bosphorus is not a very calm area. It can be quite choppy. The row of ships were kept in place with a very taut system of cables, probably two large cables that ran between Asia and Europe. Now remember, a large number of troops crossed this bridge, perhaps up to 240,000 troops. The ropes allowed the boat sufficient flexibility of movement in the turbulent waters. Each section of the bridge was built on two boats connected by planks, so the entire roadway could ride the waves, absorbing much of the surface choppiness. Persian engineers then constructed a platform across the top of the boats, then the roadway on top of that. With each wood plank, a superhighway emerged, crossing the Hellespont using battleships as the foundation. Remember, we're dealing with the hooves of tens of thousands of cavalry, including armored cavalry, which would have been much, much heavier. The ships were amazingly kept stable, so this allowed Xerxes to cross with his army into Europe and cross back when he needed to, and the ships were kept in place. And for a short period, Europe and Asia were one. 10 days later, with his bridge complete, Xerxes marched into Europe. The whole army crossed with heavy equipment, heavy cavalry, and the planks were kept in place. There was no breaking of the planks, not only due to the weight of the army crossing it, but due to the choppy waters of the Bosphorus. Xerxes' strategy was simple. Overwhelm the Greeks on land and at sea with superior numbers. Once again, the Greeks were led by the great general Themistocles. He knew he couldn't beat Xerxes on land, so the entire campaign was designed to lure the Persian navy into a trap. Unseen by the Persians, Themistocles left with most of his army, leaving only a token force of 6,000 Spartans behind. In August of 480 BC, the two armies met at a spot chosen by the Greeks, Thermopylae, a mountain pass so narrow only one chariot at a time could get through. For days, the massive Persian army was stalled, bottlenecked on the wrong side of the pass, just as the Greeks planned. Like his father before him, Xerxes was about to charge headlong into a Greek trap. When they finally broke through the narrow pass, the Persians easily destroyed the meager Spartan force Themistocles had left behind as bait and marched toward Athens. But when Xerxes reached the city, Athens was deserted. Xerxes suspected he had been duped and would make the Athenian people pay for it. For generations, tolerance for their vanquished had been the hallmark of Persian kings. 
not this time. In a very un-Persian-like act, Xerxes burnt Athens to the ground. The Persian king regretted it immediately, and the following morning ordered Athens rebuilt. But it was too late. The deed was done. His moment of rage would come back to haunt Persia nearly 200 years later. But this war was still far from over. At the same time, Themistocles was setting his trap that lured the massive Persian navy into the narrow bay at Salamis. Then he unleashed a surprise attack. The huge Persian fleet was caught in the naval equivalent of gridlock. They couldn't maneuver in the tiny bay, while the Greeks used their heavy triremes as battering rams to demolish the Persian ships. It was a decisive victory for the Greeks. Xerxes returned home defeated, king of a Persian empire that was no longer invincible. There is one high note in the Persian loss against the Greeks at the Battle of Salamis, one saving grace, a woman named Artemisia, the sole female Navy captain in the Persian fleet. She faked out the Greeks by ramming one of her own losing ships, and she sailed away to escape in the confusion. Her survival skills so impressed Xerxes that he was thought to have said, my men are becoming women, and my women are becoming men. Persian wars launched Athens into its golden age, but left the colossal Persian Empire vulnerable. It would be left to a young prince, a worshiper of Persia's great kings, to deal the empire its last blow. Humiliated by Artemisia's daring escape, the Greeks offered a huge price for her capture, but Artemisia had safely sailed home. BC, the Greeks had defeated the Persian fleet at Salamis. The aura of invincibility that surrounded this empire was gone. But there were still days of power and glory ahead for the Persian Empire. Fifteen years later, in 465 BC, the Persian king Xerxes died. Xerxes left the empire to his son, Artaxerxes who was determined to take Persia back to its golden days. He began by turning his attention to a building project begun by his grandfather, Darius. Four decades after it was started, Persepolis, the magnificent capital city, was still under construction. Now Artaxerxes would oversee one of the last great engineering projects of the Persian Empire. Today we know it as the remarkable Hall of a Hundred Columns. We know that the actual hall was some 200 by 200 feet, almost on the perfect square. And what's remarkable of the Persepolis columns is when you look up uh, the entire shaft, and these things raise, you know, hundreds of feet into, into the air, there is not one piece of displacement whatsoever. It's a perfect, perfect vertical. They're working with what we might consider to be primitive tools, just stone mallets and bronze chisels, that's all. The fluting on the columns of Persepolis is so precise, however, that these are clearly the work of master craftsmen. The columns are constructed in drums, seven or eight drums stacked on top of another. This is done by scaffolding the whole area around the column and then with a crane, a wooden crane, literally moving each column drum in place. Any client king, any governor from a distance, or even anyone who would come in that hall would be so impressed by the vastness of the hall and by this forest of columns that stretched nearly as far as the eye could see. An amazing achievement. Across the empire, Persians were still producing some of the most extraordinary feats of engineering in the ancient world. In 353 BC, the wife of a local governor began work on a magnificent tomb for her dying husband. Her tribute to him would be a marvel of engineering and would become one of the seven wonders of the ancient world. The Mausoleum of Masulus. The marble monument would rise to 135 feet tall, enclosing a great courtyard. 
The roof was a pyramid with a staircase on each side, a pathway to heaven. More than 2,500 years later, the tomb of U.S. President Ulysses S. Grant in New York City would be designed after the mausoleum of Masulus. By the fourth century BC, Persian engineering was still the finest in the world, but underneath the soaring columns and shining palaces, the empire's very foundations were crumbling, and its enemies were soon at the gate. When Athens supports a rebellion in Egypt and Greeks occupy the capital city of Memphis, Artaxerxes leaves Persepolis and his building projects, and he launches a military campaign to kick the Greeks out of Memphis and bring Egypt back under Persian control once again. It'll be the last great victory of the Persian Empire, because in 424 BC, Artaxerxes dies, leaving a power vacuum and eight solid decades of rampant infighting and neglect. And while the Persian Empire is embroiled in internal conflict and corruption, a young Macedonian prince is studying Herodotus and the accounts of the great Persian hero, Cyrus the Great. And this Macedonian prince will set his eyes on conquering the world. His name is Alexander. In 336 BC, a distant relative of Artaxerxes rose to power. He took a regal name Darius III. He will always be remembered as the king who lost an empire. Over the next four years, Alexander and Darius III met head to head in a series of fierce battles as Darius III's army was slowly pushed back to its own doorstep. In 330 BC, Alexander was at the gates of the empire's crown jewel, the capital city of Persepolis. Alexander adopted the Persian policy of respecting the defeated. None of his soldiers were allowed to pillage or plunder the lands they had conquered. But how do you tame so many soldiers after a victory over the most magnificent empire on planet E? Well, maybe his soldiers were restless or resentful, or maybe they just remembered the stories of how Athens had been burned by the Persians. In any case, at Persepolis, they let go. Huge celebrations took place after the victory, and during these celebrations, the treasury was pillaged. And then one of the saddest acts of arson in all of history took place. Persepolis was burned. Alexander uh, was not in the uh, business of destroying things. Persepolis probably was burned because it was a symbolic thing. And he also burned it uh, to make a symbolic gesture, not a destructive uh, gesture. There were, must have been wonderful draperies and things around, and no doubt fire could have begun accidentally just as much as purposefully, because if he really wanted to be an Achaemenid king, the last thing he should want to do was to destroy Persepolis. But there were no fire engines, and once the blaze had taken hold, it, it was a very terrible blaze, and it, it, it left its mark throughout the site. Darius III had escaped capture, but in the summer of 330 BC, he was murdered by a close ally. The last Achaemenid king was dead. Alexander gave Darius III a magnificent funeral and later even married his daughter. Alexander declared himself an Achaemenid Persian king and added the final chapter to the story of an empire that had spanned three continents and endured for over 2,700 years. Alexander, admirer of Persian kings, chased down the murderers of Darius and killed them himself. Alexander believed that only kings had the right to kill kings. But would have Alexander actually killed Darius? Probably not, because Alexander didn't create an empire. He only conquered one. The empire already existed, created by Cyrus the Great. No, Alexander's genius was to co-opt and use Persia, an empire that stood long before Alexander was born and whose legacy of culture and sophistication and luxury would be around long after Alexander was dead. For the History Channel, I'm Peter Weller.